County coroner has sealed off this house and the cabin behind it. A double homicide tears apart an all-American family. Zero to 60 in two shotgun blasts. Somebody had a lot of hate. He literally destroyed the lives of every family member. Hidden secrets. False panels that led to hallways. Hidden treasures. Various jewelry was contained in that box. And hidden lives. All I could see was these cold, dark eyes. It put a chill down my back. A dream house riddled with secrets. A family torn apart by lies. And the curse that consumed them all. Next, on power, privilege, and justice. probably after midnight that the storm actually began. The violent storm to end all violent storms. June 6th, 1980. An employee of Rouse Automotive arrives at work expecting a normal day. His boss, owner Bruce Rouse, is always there to greet him. Bruce Rouse was a creature of habit. Every morning, the business was open. Cash register was open. But on this day, things are very different. The business was not open. No cash had been put in the register. He dials his boss's home and reaches Bruce Rouse's 15-year-old son, Billy. He said, I'm at the gas station. Your dad's not here, and I need a key to the safe. Can I just swing by the house to, to get it, and uh, I won't bother you at all? And Billy said, hold on a minute. And Billy put down the phone. About a minute or so later, he hears screaming. Somebody's on police. Yeah, this is Billy Ralph. My parents were killed in bed. Where do you live? 2057 North Avenue. At approximately 9 a.m. that morning, I received a page and was told that I was needed immediately out in the Libertyville area. Investigators rush to the scene, a sprawling equestrian estate in the town's most exclusive neighborhood. This was a rather prominent house. Upon pulling in a driveway, naturally, there were several marked police cars uh, on scene already, along with several detective squads. Billy Rouse, his 16-year-old sister Robin, and 19-year-old brother Kurt sit on the lawn, stunned as detectives head into the house. The crime scene is in the very northern portion of the house where the master bedroom is. And as they got to the master bedroom, they found Mr. and Mrs. Rouse. Mr. Rouse was wearing a t-shirt and boxer shorts. Mrs. Rouse was wearing a nightie. Mother had sustained a shotgun wound to the head. The father had also received a shotgun blast to the side of his face. He was also bludgeoned several times in the head area and then stabbed seven times in the heart. This was a very, very heinous crime. Without a doubt, any investigator that's had any time in, in looking at these types of crime scenes, one of the first things that they're going to say is that whoever did this had just a ton of hatred. When the children are questioned, they can't imagine who would want their parents dead. And unfortunately, none of them heard or saw anything unusual the night before. Young Billy told police that his mother had the ladies over for bridge that afternoon and that his father worked late and went straight to bed. Billy said goodnight to his mom and went to his room. But what started as a sedate evening would soon turn ominous. Everyone recounted this incredibly violent lightning and thunderstorm that happened that night. They described that the thunder was so prevalent that it was occurring so often that even if there had been gunshot blasts, even somebody outside hunting, that they wouldn't have heard it because of the constant noise. 
Kurt, who lived in the coach house a few hundred feet from the main residence, hadn't seen his parents at all that evening. As for Robin, she had been out late attending a dance at her school, the prestigious Lake Forest Academy. I left the dance at about 11.30, proceeded to take her girlfriend home, and then drove right back to her residence for the evening. She went straight to her bedroom and didn't hear a thing until the phone rang the next morning. And although there's no sign of forced entry, the Rouse children admit that they often left the front door unlocked. Crime scene techs begin processing the mansion for clues. There was just an unbelievable amount of work that needed to be done within the initial scene. Now you have this massive house that needs to be checked and looked at. It was kind of um, a two-story ranch-style home that had an indoor pool all of the amenities, but it was just very unusually laid out. There were false panels that were found upstairs in, in various rooms that led to actual hidden hallways that connected parts of the house, and you could go from one end of the house to the other. Cops realize an intruder could have snuck through the home without being detected and hidden out for hours or longer. And I remember going into those panels, and it's actually an access way for service technicians to do plumbing repair and stuff. Actually kind of eerie. Beneath the indoor pool is another secret crawl space. That went the entire length of the house to the point of where we sent investigators into that crawl space with extension cords and handheld floodlights, and they literally disappeared into the darkness. They determined that Darlene Rouse's purse and her jewelry box are missing. In the hallway, they make a more disturbing discovery. The father was an avid hunter, owned a lot of guns and a lot of ammunition. Those guns and everybody, the ammunition were missing from the house. I remember there were some news teams starting to pull up. A word travels fast in a case like this. Everybody knew of Mr. Rouse and Mrs. Rouse. A fluent family, apparently an all-American family, and suddenly Bruce and Darlene show up dead. There was this feeling of despair and that tension that is always in the air immediately after a violent crime, particularly in an area like this where the police are not used to murder scenes. This was unusual, this was shocking, and the police seemed overwhelmed at the time. Almost immediately, rumors swirl that Bruce may have had some bad business dealings with the wrong sort of people. Detectives hope the Rouse children can shed some light on their father's personal and professional life. One of the things we, as the investigators, wanted to do was to immediately remove the children from the scene and get them downtown. The primary focus was trying to interview those kids to try to get some background. Before they can complete their questioning, detectives are cut off. Relatives then arrived on scene, and the next thing we know, attorneys arrived, and that slammed the door on us, investigators. Even with the best shrinks money could buy, those poor kids were going to be scarred for life. And, as investigators would soon find out, there may have been deeper problems in the Rouse family than anyone expected. Libertyville, Illinois. It's very small, everybody knows each other. I and others knew about the Rouse family, Bruce Rouse was a businessman. He had a number of businesses. If you had a car, chances are you were going to come in contact with the Rouses. Bruce still worked. He worked every day. The bodies were discovered because it was 6 o'clock in the morning and Bruce wasn't at the station yet. I don't know that you've got many wealthy men who still go to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, but Bruce was one of those people. In the 1950s, fresh out of Libertyville High School, Bruce Rouse met and fell in love with Darlene Stenland. He bought his first gas station, and the couple worked day and night to build not only a successful business, but also a family. By the 1970s, the hard work had paid off. The Rouses were one of the wealthiest families in Libertyville. They moved their three young children into a 13-room mansion on seven acres, complete with stables and a guest cottage. The overall size of the house itself the fact of the uh, in-ground pool, indoor pool, a separate guest house, very affluent people. Bruce and Darlene showered their children with the finer things. 
they had everything. I mean, they had ponies and saddles and horses and a stable and four-wheelers and all the toys that you would expect to see in the type of an affluent family. Darlene was a stay-at-home mother, but, you know, went to her bridge parties, went to her tennis games. Rouse himself was a very successful businessman, not just in Libertyville, but all throughout Lake County. Made a lot of money. He employed a lot of people. They lived a life of privilege. The children drove expensive cars, went to good schools, and the Rouse's projected an image of nouveau riche. But Bruce was always trying to expand his empire. Friends say he had started seeking new business ventures and may have been in over his head. Supposedly, Bruce had money invested in a couple of different companies, was involved in things like cable TV, which back then was uh, a relatively new. The fact that he was willing to take chances, he may have partnered up or gotten into a partnership, and that possibly this was a hit. There were theories that uh, Mr. Rouse had been involved in a business deal involving the Mafia, and that maybe this was a business deal gone bad. But after interviewing some of Bruce and Darlene's closest friends, investigators discover there may have been bigger problems inside the Rouse mansion. On the outside, this was a successful family with attractive children, a successful business father, well-to-do, good schools. But evidently, there was drug abuse, there were guns in the house, there were frequent parties. The Rouse family, they were not what they appeared to be. If it was one of those kind of families, and to say dysfunctional might be a good term. That was a family that had everything, but yet they had nothing. The love and the closeness just didn't seem to be there. The relationship with Kurt seemed particularly strained. Kurt and the family didn't quite see eye to eye. We had the reputation for being a party guy and a little bit of drugs involved. Kurt was even offered some money if he'd go into the military, but he refused to do that. He had no really gainful employment. Cops learned Bruce and Darlene were fed up with his lack of direction and banished him from the home. He had been sent to a coach house on the property and his electrical supply was a 200 yard extension cord from the main house and he was only allowed in the house when parents were home. But where Kurt could do no right, Robin could do no wrong. Robin was in that private school type of crowd, the upper crust of society. She was daddy's girl, no question about that. She was given special attention that the other boys didn't get. And poor Billy was often lost in the shadow of his older siblings. Prior to the murders, Bill was going to an alternative school for alternative behavior. And there emerged, once the bubble burst, a picture that the Rouses were not a happy family and that there had been trouble before. The veneer of this family being so successful and so happy and well-adjusted was shattered. Police had searched high and low for a likely villain, from Chicago wise guys to the pump jockeys in Bruce's employ. Now they had to wonder if the real enemy had been living under the couple's noses all along. In the days following the shotgun killings of Bruce and Darlene Rouse, their mansion remains wrapped in crime scene tape and mystery, and the unsolved murders continue to haunt their quaint town. Libertyville really was not the sort of place that had violent crime, which is why people moved there in the first place. This is a community that didn't want its image to be Libertyville, the village of the Rouse murders. Without answers, the public is left to speculate. It's the type of thing that you would expect to happen in a relatively small town where you have this ghastly crime and no one's in jail. People decide for themselves what happened. Was it a robbery gone wrong, a targeted hit, or something else? As whispers of family strife spread quickly, the wealthy Rouse children began to shift from victims to suspects. The community, they were very alarmed. They hated to have the thoughts that there was a killer running loose in the village, number one, and secondly, hated the thought of that maybe one of these children could be responsible for these murders. There was no break-in. There'd been a thunderstorm. The 
couple was shotgunned to death in their beds, apparently while they slept in the middle of the night. The only other persons in or around the crime scene at the time were their adolescent children. Detectives begin to monitor the kids from afar. Now living with relatives in town, their behavior begins to raise red flags. The first thing I noticed is there was no grieving. There was no, no tears. Nobody seemed to be super upset. They were matter-of-factly being talked to and matter-of-factly answered questions they were being asked. We found out later, uh, one of the kids had asked, does this mean I'm not gonna be able to go to the graduation party tonight, so. But cold-heartedness does not a murderer make. And without any physical evidence pointing to the killer's identity, police can do nothing but watch as Kurt, Robin, and Billy cash in on their million-dollar inheritance. As a result of the, the estate settlement, they had all kinds of money to do just about anything they wanted to. Basically, Bill's stipend was $1,500 a month. We saw that Robin ended up with a shiny new sports car, so times were good. Suspicion grows as people now see the orphans living it up off their dead parents' money. But an army of attorneys and relatives make sure they're inaccessible to the police. Right from the very beginning, there was never any meaningful dialogue between the police and the children. They didn't have anything to tie it together. They didn't have the interviews with the children that they needed to connect all the dots. Then, two months after the murders, the youngest son, Billy, reaches out to investigators. In August of 1980, Bill wanted to talk to us and see if he could help us cooperate with this investigation. If he requested that we bring the pictures of the crime scene. We thought that that was very unusual, uh, very interesting. And the officers said, these are very graphic, violent photographs. You're not going to want to look at these, Billy. And Billy said, no, I'll, I'll take a look at the photographs. We'll see if I can help you in, in this investigation. As Billy examines the pictures, investigators examine him. Whenever Billy came to a photograph of his mother or father, he would stop and he would fixate on the photograph. He would stare at it. He wouldn't laugh, he wouldn't cry, he wouldn't sob. He simply fixated and stared at the photograph. And then he would say, see that chair here next to my mom's bed? Oh, her purse is missing from that chair. If you look on this dresser here, my mother's jewelry box is missing from there. It was pretty obvious to us that he wanted to divert the attention from the family and have us try to focus on an intruder, which we didn't buy. Another two months go by without any new leads in the case. Then, a hidden secret surfaces. A surveyor was walking down the Des Plaines River on Milwaukee Avenue and Route 60. He reached and pulled up what he thought was a pipe. Well, it turns out that it was a 16-gauge shotgun. He got about 15 feet further south, and he tripped over another bag. He saw that there was a purse in it. He pulled out of the purse a wallet, and he opened the wallet, took his thumb, and he wiped the plastic clean so that he could see what was on the other side of the plastic window, and he saw a driver's license. It was the driver's license of Darlene Rouse. Detectives rushed to the river's edge with a dive team. We were probably able to recover about 11 guns, the mother's purse uh, with her driver's license and credit card and identification in it, the jewelry box, various jewelry that was contained in that box. We amassed a lot of physical evidence out of that river that we were able to match as having been from the Ralph's home. It's a major break in the case. If we had a burglar in that home, they most certainly wouldn't have thrown the jewelry in the river. It ended up in a pawn shop somewhere, and uh, the same with the purse. You know, the driver's license were there, credit cards were there, none of it which had been used. Suddenly, Billy's story makes no sense at all. Billy was leading the police to believe that this murder could have occurred during a residential burglary gone bad, but 
the Des Plaines River finding totally shot that theory out of the water. It was pretty clear that little Billy was covering for someone, but who? While well, the people of Libertyville may have been sleeping a bit easier, there was still a killer on the loose, and police were starting to suspect he lived just a few feet away. With the discovery of the Rouse's missing valuables at the bottom of the river, police grow increasingly suspicious that the murders were an inside job. A lot of the focus was on Kurt Rouse. Kurt was a hippie. You know, Kurt had long hair, he had a beard, he lived out in the old servants' quarters on the property. Uh, he was into music a lot. People automatically assumed that, that Kurt had been the one who killed his parents. Then, detectives get a call from a college in Iowa where Kurt's ex-girlfriend is a student. Police there discovered that Kurt had filled out a gun permit and was later seen stalking the ex. He disappeared before campus police could catch him. When detectives head to Iowa to question the ex, she says Kurt never talked about the murders. With his shaggy hair and faraway eyes, Kurt had a certain air of Manson family about him, but investigators didn't have any hard evidence that the suspected stalker was the murderer. Their only hope was to get one of his siblings to talk. We thought if there was any way to get to any of these kids, it would have been through Robin. Robin had made some indications that she felt that possibly her brother was involved in the murder of her parents. But that was all the information that was given. No reason why she felt this, uh, and, and no specific information as to why she felt it was her brother. We felt, at the very least, maybe Robin might have had some knowledge of this. Either she came home and caught him the act, or she caught him bringing the guns, or maybe the jewelry box out to the father's vehicle. The state's attorney's office were working to attempt to possibly grant Robin Rouse immunity to come forward and testify at a grand jury. But days before Robin is scheduled to meet with police, the case takes a haunting and tragic turn. Robin was driving her vehicle on a rain slick highway in Racine, Wisconsin. She lost control of that vehicle and she brought slid into a light standard. She suffered massive head injuries and Robin was gone. Rumors start up that she was on her way to tell the authorities about what had happened everybody thinking that Kurt was the bad guy, that Kurt had done something to Robin's car and caused her to die. That was a major setback to us because up until that point in time, we had dried up with leads. Any information that had come back, whether it be phone records or, or crime lab reports, just didn't generate any more lead information that we could follow up on. Now, detectives have no choice but to shelve the case. Suspicion doesn't make arrests, evidence does, and in this case, the evidence simply was not there. But the case continues to haunt investigators. I carried this case all my life. It was like a thorn kind of jabbing you all the time, you know, something you just didn't let go. You don't give up. You don't stop. You don't ever stop. You wait, and sometimes that waiting game takes a little bit longer. For years, detectives keep tabs on both sons. Billy heads south to Key West, Florida, while Kurt heads to California under a cloud of suspicion. Kurt was still living in his little world of uh, acid rock and roll and drug usage. At first, Billy seemed to be putting his troubled past behind him. He did inherit a lot of money from his parents, got married, had learned a trade. He was a carpenter. He paid $100,000 cash for a home on Petronia Street in Key West and then added another 90000 to that to remodel the home. But slowly, Billy's life began to unravel. He ended up getting divorced. He ended up going through all the money. He was living on an old barge anchored off of Key West with a hut made out of doors and discarded pieces of construction material. A far cry from the Rouse mansion, the floating shack became home sweet home to Billy and assorted other down-and-outers. 
The shack that they were living, it was like a makeshift little hut. I'd say this whole unit was maybe eight feet by 10 feet. When they went to the bathroom, they went off the side of this makeshift house. Didn't have any money, was basically shoplifting to stay alive. He would do any kind of drugs or alcohol that he'd get his hands on. In 1995, 15 years after the murders of Bruce and Darlene Rouse, investigators get a phone call from a detective in Key West. I knew it was about Billy. He proceeded to tell me that Billy had been arrested as an accomplice in a bank robbery, and I believe possibly two bank robberies that had occurred down in Key West, and that Billy was currently locked up in the Monroe County Jail. We took that as an opportunity to go down and interview everyone who would ever come in contact with Billy and possibly interview him at some point. We were hoping when we went to Key West that in some drunken night or in some emotional moment, Billy had said something, anything, to someone. Billy's robbery charges might give them the leverage they need to finally get some answers about what happened that stormy night. When we first met him, he was obviously somebody who was very troubled. The look in his eyes was just like a vacant stare. It was like looking into, into a hole in a wall. He essentially talked about family life. He talked about the death of his parents. Whenever Billy would start talking about his mother, it was like flicking a light switch on. I could not believe with the amount of time that had passed how much hatred came out of him when I mentioned his mother. It was like two different people. It just changed like that. I almost saw that same look come back into his eyes as I did the first time I looked into him in 1980. It was absolutely amazing. We got to a point where Billy said, you know, I just have this blank, this, this black hole in my mind when it comes to that night. And he says, I'm not saying I didn't do it, and I'm not saying that I did it. I just can't remember what happened that night. The investigation reaches a standstill, but detectives refuse to give up. As Billy and his escorts were walking from the jail, they ended up meeting outside of the interview room door. And Chuck said to Billy, I know you've been troubled uh, for 15 years. Uh, We've been real close the last couple of days, and uh, I know you'd like to put the demons behind you. And the next statement Bill made was, I shot my dad. Billy's telltale heart had finally gotten the best of him. After all those years, he was about to give police a blow-by-blow -blow account of what really happened in the Rouse house that dark and stormy night. After 15 years of silence, Billy Rouse shocks investigators with a blunt confession. When Billy said, I did it, I killed my parents, Chuck literally felt himself rock back on his heels. It was pandemonium. Get these cameras, let's get gold, let's get this guy while he's willing the dog. I'm going to take you back to the night of June the 5th of 1980. You were 15 at the time, right, Bill? Yeah. The story he tells them is one of resentment, disapproval, and drug-induced rage. We walked into the bathroom, which is right off, off the back door. Okay. Walked out, and there was my mom. And she don't even smoke a pie. And I said, no, I want to smoke a pie. So she walked out of me and said, she smelled like liquor. And then she says, yeah, don't worry about it. You're going to be shipped off in military school. I'm just over it. You're going to be just like your brother. What did you reply to your mom? I said, you're full of You just worry about yourself. Make it easier. Just get me out of your life. Bill's problem wasn't with his father. His problem was with his mother. And simply put, in his words, she just constantly nagged him. There was nothing that he could do right. I'm just saying, I'm sick of this bull. Man, I got to get them up. Out of my life, one of the two. I just had enough. I was treated unfairly. 
I was showing no love. The only time I was acknowledged in that family is when my mother hollered at me and told me that I was going to amount to nothing in life. Even making the comment that, you know, you're gonna end up just like your brother Kurt, a nobody, a nothing. And he says, I, I just had it. I, I couldn't take it anymore. Okay, and then what did you decide? I decided I was gonna get rid of him. And he went to the closet next door to his bedroom where his dad kept the shotguns and the rifles. He said he pulled out a shotgun and he went back and he sat in his bedroom cleaning the barrels of the shotgun. I started playing around with a 22. I don't know why. I thought I was a neat old gun. But I'm going 16 days to get in the walk around the house. I said, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I sat there for about 10 minutes looking at it. And what was going through your mind? You are a loser. What's wrong with you? How I should do it. How you should kill your mom? Or You, you said well, before you really didn't want to kill your dad. No, I didn't want to. Okay. That's what I said. I had the knife at first. You thought it would be quieter and your, uh -huh. maybe your dad wouldn't wake? Yeah. And then, what did you say? You thought it would be too slow also? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So what did you do then? So I walked in the room, took the 16 guys, put it up to her head. I don't remember pulling it, but the trigger went off. Okay. Then what did you do then? But my dad sat up real quick. The trigger went off again. It wasn't that good of a shot. It just grazed him more or less. I ran around the other side and started hitting him with the butt of the gun. And, and I, don't, I don't know how many times I had him. I had him, but he, that didn't work. He was still. Okay. And I didn't want him I didn't want him in misery. So I grabbed the knife and I stabbed him and then went until he quit moving. Then Bill was in a quandary. Why did I do this? What am I gonna do? And how am I gonna make it look like I wasn't involved in this thing? I took the jewelry box, I brought that up, hit it in the utility room, and I went back in and messed up some drawers. Then I saw her purse there, so I took the tab, took a bunch of credit cards and stuff. What were you gonna do? I don't know, man. I was thinking, man, I'll take a credit card and get out of the state. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking, man. Billy took his father's car and sped to the edge of town. As he comes up to the Des Plaines River on 21 and 60, now it's raining, violently raining. So Bill parks the car along uh, the roadway above the river, gets out of the car, goes down and takes a look at the river. Then he makes two or three trips and throws all these proceeds from the home the shotguns, the ammunition, the purse, the clothing, the jewelry box. He throws them in the river. I don't remember exactly, man. I know I was thinking about the front door. Okay. And then I figured, man, I got to, how'd I do this, man? What, why'd I do this? He got into the car and he started driving. He got on 94 and he was thinking, I'm just going to leave. And as he was driving, he thought to himself, it's not going to look too good. My parents show up dead in bed and one of their sons is now out of state. So he then decided to turn around and go back north, back up to Libertyville, and to go home. Are you sorry that your parents are dead, Bill? Yes and no. Yes, because I had to deal with them was gone. And then, no, because it really got my sister. Any time over this last 15 years, have you ever had any discussion with Kurt about it? You know, the subject has never come up. I've never told nobody. If I had told anybody anything about it, it had to be a drunken stupor, which ain't unusual for me to be in a drunken stupor. That's the only way I could deal with it. It's eaten me up for 15 years. I don't really don't give it about my life right now. I'm just you. I look, look at the way I've lived. 
But as a result of him being locked up for 30 days in a Monroe County jail, he actually dried out. He had no opportunity for the drugs. He had no opportunity for the alcohol. What he did have an opportunity for was now dealing with the guilt. How much can you drink? I can't tell you how much I've drank in 15 years. How much did I have to get my hands on? When you're used to living in a drugged out, boozed up state, going cold turkey can be a rude awakening. For most people, it's a daily struggle. But at first, Billy seemed oddly at peace. He was willing to come back and face the music. And for us, we're in Key West. We flew into a Miami. We had Bill in the car with for that 161 mile drive. His attitude was relaxed. Cracked jokes, humorous at times. Said, hey, Chuck, could I drive? Kind of like the weight of the world was lifted off of his shoulder. He was finally able to release that pressure. But police aren't home free. Right away, when you know that you have a confession, one of the things that the defense is going to attack is how that confession was obtained. You know you're in for a beating, but felt very confident that we were going to come out with a guilty plea. But when Billy lawyers up, it's clear he has no intention of going down quietly. The defense based its argument on the idea that the confession was coerced. They believe that Billy's long history of substance abuse made him a poor candidate for police interrogation and eventually agreed to say something that was not true. The defense tried to turn this entire case over on its head and suggest that Kurt, the oldest boy, was the one who had committed the crime. Billy's inner brat was rearing its ugly head. After blaming his parents for sending him into a fatal rage, Billy decided he'd try and sandbag his brother. Everyone in town braced for the final showdown. Investigators' first challenge is getting Kurt to court. Kurt was living in San Francisco after the 15 years, and he was very hurt by all this. Everywhere he went in Libertyville after the murders, people would point at him, people would whisper, there's the murderer. And he said that hurt him very much. To, to, to that day, it still hurt him very much. He didn't want to come back. But he said, you know, you got his confession. You don't need me. But the state knows Kurt's testimony will be critical. You need those questions answered because so many people had those questions. You know, could Kurt have done the murders? What did Kurt know? Did Kurt help Billy clean up? On July 31st, 1996, the murder trial of Billy Rouse opens in Lake County, Illinois. The prosecution starts with the most damaging evidence, Billy's account of the murder. He started from the beginning and went through the entire night, the entire series of events, pretty much without having to be asked questions. He was very matter of fact about it. There were so many details that he gave in the confession. Again, not only things that corroborated or supported what we already knew by details that he gave us that we were unaware of that clearly he was the guy who committed the crime the jury they were allowed to see that confession they saw there was no coercion there they saw that bill was in his comfort zone smoking cigarettes drinking coffee and that it was a fluent conversation but the proof's in the pudding Then, it's Kurt Rouse's turn to face his baby brother. Everyone wonders if the tables could turn. All the, the gossip in the area was all that Kurt was the bad guy. Kurt was the wolf man and he had killed his parents. When Kurt came into the courtroom, it was the first time that they had laid eyes on each other for 10 years or more. And Kurt walked over to the defense table and put his hand uh, down on Billy's shoulder. The defense paints Kurt as a shiftless teen who had been exiled from the home and was at war with his parents. But in the end, his tearful testimony only helps the prosecution. The defense is trying to make it look like Kurt is the killer who is letting his brother swing in criminal charges. And here, Kurt is forlorn. Billy had never told him that he had killed their parents. You know, Kurt knew it wasn't me. You know, it probably wasn't Robin. It was probably Billy. While the lawyers were up arguing in front of the judge, Kurt is sitting there by himself. He looks over on the edge of the witness stand, sees a picture of his sister. He holds it and then holds it closer to his chest. 
and looks at the picture and starts sobbing. It was, I think, a moment that probably told the jurors more about Kurt Rouse and the kind of person that he was than anything else that I ever could have told to the jury. The jury deliberates for nearly six hours before returning with their verdict. Guilty. At his defense table, Billy remains unmoved. There was no reaction. No. The people who were in the courtroom said he didn't blink, he didn't flinch. The mood in the courtroom and in the small town of Libertyville is equally somber. There is no victory in anything like that. There's only justice. And the community was relieved that it was over. Again, just happy to have it done with. I just had to say to myself, that is just, that's sad. That's just devastating that two human lives were lost. Billy's situation, I think he was just a, a little spoiled kid that was upset because his mom wouldn't let him leave the lifestyle that he wanted to lead. And, and he made a really bad decision. Unlike most family homicides, the Ross murders weren't motivated by greed or revenge. They were just desperate, evil acts by a very disturbed boy. The Ross house became known as the murder mansion, traded hands a few times, and then, in 2002, spontaneously burned to the ground. For True TV, I'm Dominic Dunn. County coroner is sealed off this house and the cabin behind it. A double homicide tears apart an all-American family. Zero to 60 in two shotgun blasts. Somebody had a lot of hate. He literally destroyed the lives of every family member. Hidden secrets. False panels that led to hallways. Hidden treasures. Various jewelry was contained in that box. And hidden lives. All I could see was these cold, dark eyes. It put a chill down my back. A dream house riddled with secrets, a family torn apart by lies, and the curse that consumed them all. Next, on power, privilege, and justice. probably after midnight that the storm actually began. The violent storm to end all violent storms. June 6th, 1980. An employee of Rouse Automotive arrives at work expecting a normal day. His boss, owner Bruce Rouse, is always there to greet him. Bruce Rouse was a creature of habit. Every morning, the business was open. Cash register was open. But on this day, things are very different. The business was not open. No cash had been put in the register. He dials his boss's home and reaches Bruce Rouse's 15-year-old son, Billy. He said, I'm at the gas station. Your dad's not here, and I need a key to the safe. Can I just swing by the house to, to get it, and uh, I won't bother you at all? And Billy said, hold on a minute. And Billy put down the phone. About a minute or so later, he hears screaming. Somebody's police. Yeah, this is Billy Ralph. My parents were killed in bed. Where do you live? 2057 North Block Avenue. At approximately 9 a.m. that morning, I received a page and was told that I was needed immediately out in the Libertyville area. Investigators rush to the scene, a sprawling equestrian estate in the town's most exclusive neighborhood. This was a rather prominent house. Upon pulling in a driveway, naturally, there were several marked police cars uh, on scene already, along with several detective squads. Billy Rouse, his 16-year-old sister Robin, and 19-year-old brother Kurt sit on the lawn, stunned as detectives head into the house. The crime scene is in the very 
northern portion of the house where the master bedroom is. And as they got to the master bedroom, they found Mr. and Mrs. Rouse. Mr. Rouse was wearing a t-shirt and boxer shorts. Mrs. Rouse was wearing a nightie. Mother had sustained a shotgun wound to the head. The father had also received a shotgun blast to the side of his face. He was also bludgeoned several times in the head area and then stabbed seven times in the heart. This was a very, very heinous crime. Without a doubt, any investigator that's had any time in, in looking at these types of crime scenes, one of the first things that they're going to say is that whoever did this had just a ton of hatred. When the children are questioned, they can't imagine who would want their parents dead. And unfortunately, none of them heard or saw anything unusual the night before. Young Billy told police that his mother had the ladies over for bridge that afternoon and that his father worked late and went straight to bed. Billy said goodnight to his mom and went to his room. But what started as a sedate evening would soon turn ominous. Everyone recounted this incredibly violent lightning and thunderstorm that happened that night. They described that the thunder was so prevalent that it was occurring so often that even if there had been gunshot blasts, even somebody outside hunting, that they wouldn't have heard it because of the constant noise. Kurt, who lived in the coach house a few hundred feet from the main residence, hadn't seen his parents at all that evening. As for Robin, she had been out late attending a dance at her school the prestigious Lake Forest Academy. Left the dance at about 11.30, proceeded to take her girlfriend home, and then drove right back to her residence for the evening. She went straight to her bedroom and didn't hear a thing until the phone rang the next morning. And although there's no sign of forced entry, the Rouse children admit that they often left the front door unlocked. Crime scene techs begin processing the mansion for clues. There was just an unbelievable amount of work that needed to be done within the initial scene. Now you have this massive house that needs to be checked and looked at. It was kind of um, a two-story ranch-style home that had an indoor pool, all of the amenities, but it was just very unusually laid out. There were false panels that were found upstairs in, in various rooms that led to actual hidden hallways that connected parts of the house and you could go